Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Russell Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Labour increased taxes by £40 billion pounds in yesterday's Halloween budget, the biggest tax heist ever. Anna Sarwar's party put up national insurance, whisky duty, inheritance tax, North Sea taxes. They brought in a family farm tax, pension tax and VAT on independent schools. Labour has chosen to hammer workers and to declare war on business. But the SNP Finance Secretary described Labour's budget as a Let's step hear Mr. in the right direction. So if a £40 billion pound tax rise is just a step in the right direction, how much does the First Minister think it should be? First Minister. So, so where I have sympathy with the Labour government in the United Kingdom is that they have inherited an entirely unsustainable set of circumstances in the public finances because of the absolutely menacing agenda of the Conservative government for 14 years. And it is the ultimate deceit for Mr Finlay and the Conservatives to criticise those of us who have to take difficult decisions to clear up the mess that the Conservatives have created. Russell Finlay. Well, it's, it's nice to hear the First Minister defending Labour for shamelessly breaking their promises not to raise taxes on working people. The Office of Budget Responsibility says the vast majority of Labour's uh, national insurance rise will be passed on to workers. This comes after years of crippling SNP tax rises. Scotland's taxpayers cannot afford and do not deserve more taxes next year. They need a break after years of the SNP swiping their cash. So isn't it about time John Swinney considered reducing income tax for hard-working Scots? First Minister. Russell Finlay um, uh, misconstrues the remarks that I'm making. It's up to the Labour Party to defend their position. I will set out my analysis of the horror show that the Conservatives yeah. have inflicted on this country by their management of the economy for the last 14 years. Absolute horror show that the Conservatives have inflicted on, on, on working people in this country, on our public services, on those with any vulnerability, on anybody paying a mortgage. Yeah. Every one of them yeah. has been punished by the incompetence of the Conservative government. <laughs> in a, and, and of course, Mr Finlay, and I know he doesn't like this, was one of those who yeah. told me I had to follow That's in Liz so Truss's yeah. footsteps. Yeah. Thank goodness I never did that in any of my decisions. So what I will say to Russell Finlay is that we've taken decisions to increase tax in Scotland because we wanted to invest in our public services. And that has improved our public services to meet the needs of people in Scotland. We've faced the reality. If Mr Finlay wants to stand here and defend spending cuts to the people of Scotland, he's welcome to do it. I'm not going to follow in his footsteps. Russell Finlay. I tell you what, I tell you what, John Swinney's got some front. The man whose dirty fingerprints are all over the tram scandal, the ferry scandal, the salmon inquiry scandal, the named persons scandal. How, how much has this man's mistakes cost all of us? I'm on the side of Scotland's taxpayers who want fairness and justice. And the same goes for Scottish business, who were quick to cast their verdict on Labour's tax-raising budget. The Scottish Hospitality Group, the Scotch Whisky Association, Offshore Energies UK and the National Farmers Union Scotland have all hit out. Labour have broken their promises to businesses. But will John Swinney keep his pledge made in last month's programme for government to support Scottish business owners? Will he now act decisively to cut taxes on Scottish business? First Minister. So it's part of my duty as First Minister to make sure that Parliament is properly informed about its history. It's part of my duty since I've been here since the very beginning. And on the question of the trams, 
I did not want to spend a single farthing on the trams. I wanted to spend that £500 million on duelling the A9, and the Tories forced me to spend it on trams. Thank you. So let's, let's, let's have Let's nothing. hear one another. It's so important that Mr Finlay does not do anything that might potentially mislead Parliament. It's part of my duty to correct his mistakes when he comes here. And when it comes to, and when it comes to, and when it comes to working with Scottish business, I'm delighted with the engagement the Deputy First Minister is taking forward in leading the Government's approach to investment, the dialogue with business. I look forward to discussing these issues when I attend the Scottish Financial Enterprise annual event tonight in the City of Glasgow. I look forward to discussing the success of the financial sector in the competitive climate that we create in Scotland. That's what business will get from my government. Russell Finlay. Uh, I, think, I, think I think I've touched the nerve. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, John, John, John Swinney. Let's hear Mr John, Finlay. John Swinney protests his honesty here. But let's not forget the tram inquiry found that he had been responsible for a lack of candour. Now, the tax burden on Scottish workers and businesses is far too high. But the SNP and Labour think they are entitled to keep taking more and more while Scotland's public services get worse and worse. This drives the disconnect between politicians and people. In the Scottish budget, John Swinney could go another way. The SNP could stop raising taxes and let people keep more of their own hard-earned money. Yeah. So why won't John Swinney look to bring down bills for Scottish workers and businesses? First Minister. The problem with what Mr Finlay brings to Parliament, which his colleagues bring to Parliament, is that he's standing in front of me today arguing for a reduction in taxation. That involves a reduction then in public expenditure. But the, but the problem, but it, it, now I'm, I'm being told that that's not correct, so I'm going to say it again, <laughs> because that is what is involved. If you reduce taxation, then you reduce public expenditure yes. in the commensurate amount, because we have to balance the budget. And of course, we've done that for 17 continuous years as the Scottish Government. But the problem with Mr Finlay is that he's here today talking about tax cuts. Every other day of the week, the Tories are here demanding we yeah. spend more money on different aspects of the public services. So when Mr Finlay talks about nerves, the issue is not touching a raw nerve with me. It's the nerve of Mr Finlay who comes here calling for reductions in tax when he wants us to spend more. That's some nerve, presiding officer. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, Rachel Reeves announced the first Labour budget in 14 years. And after 14 years of Tory chaos, division and decline, it was a transformative and game-changing budget for Scotland. It delivers... Let it delivers us hear the Mr Sarwar. ...in the election... Quite finished. Can we please hear Mr Sarwar? No one else has been called to speak. After 14 years, it delivers on the promises made in the election, ends the era of austerity, provides vital new investment for our public services and prioritises economic growth. And it includes the largest block grant settlement to the Scottish Parliament in the history of devolution. That's £1.5 billion pounds of additional funding for the Scottish Government this year and a further £3.4 billion pounds next year. That means the block grant will be £47.7 billion pounds next year, a Labour government delivering for the people of Scotland. So will the First Minister welcome this transformative budget, welcome the end of the era of austerity and welcome this new investment for Scotland? First Minister. I don't think any of us are surprised that Mr Sawar has just so excited this afternoon in his questions to Parliament. But let me let me provide let me provide some 
calming influence <laughs> in the parliamentary discourse this afternoon. The budget is a step in the right direction. I accept that and I welcome that. The increase in funding for this financial year largely accords with the expectations that the, government, the Scottish Government had to deal with the issues of pay and the pressures of inflation that the Finance Secretary has shared with Parliament already. The funding for next year is, uh, is welcome. It, it delivers for Scotland um, an increase because of Barnet consequentials in health and education, but we have to be conscious that there will be negative consequentials arising out of financial implications for areas such as culture, environment and transport. So there is a net implication given uh, for the public finances in Scotland. There also remains significant uncertainty about the impact of the increase in employers' national insurance contributions yeah. on public spending in Scotland. Uh, we have to publish a budget on the 4th of December and there is currently uncertainty about whether our public finances will be compensated in yeah. full yeah. for yeah. all that's involved in advance of that budget on the 4th of December. And that, of course, is not an insignificant sum. It's a £500 yeah. million pounds question. So we will, of course, engage constructively with the United Kingdom government on these questions. I suppose where my regret comes from is the fact that in the financial estimate set out by the Chancellor yesterday, she's indicated over the course of a three-year period there will be a £10 billion surplus in the budget. And that's obviously encouraging. But she wasn't able to find a single penny to lift the two-child cap that is putting and forcing families into poverty in our country today, and I regret that very deeply. Yeah. Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, the, the Scottish public accept that we can't fix every problem with one budget, but John Swinney was desperate to be disappointed with this budget, and he's so through gritted teeth having to welcome the record level of investment here in Scotland. And the fact is that this is a historic budget rise for the Scottish Government, delivered by a Labour government. On top of that, this budget also delivered £1.4 billion of investment in local Scottish infrastructure. A pay rise for 200,000 of the lowest paid workers. An extension to the fuel duty cut that will benefit 3.2 million Scots. Massive investment in the publicly owned GB Energy headquartered in Aberdeen. A COVID corruption commissioner to get our money back Let's from hear dodgy Mr. Tory deals. Compensation for the inflicted blood victims and the victims of the Horizon post office scandal. An end to the miners' pensioner in I'm sorry, Presiding Officer, there's just so much for Scotland in this budget, more and more that I could go on. So does the First Minister accept that this change is only possible because Scotland voted to get rid of that rotten Tory government and elected a Labour government that ended the era of austerity and is changing the lives of people across Scotland? First Minister. Mr. Sawar is very, very excited today. I think he's just... Uh, I, 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 I've, I've got that sense that he doth protesteth too much, is what it strikes me. Uh, I, there's, there's, there's many measures in the budget that uh, are welcome, and I'm particularly pleased that there is a reliable source of funding made available for the inflict, infected blood scandal yeah. victims, because, and those affected and infected, because I have constituents yeah. who have given tenacious leadership to making sure this injustice was corrected. I think of my constituent, Bill Wright, whenever I think of this issue, and I'm very pleased that the Labour government has done that, and it's to their credit that they have done that. Of course, there are uh, many issues uh, that are welcome in the budget. I, I argued, for example, that the Chancellor had to change the fiscal rules. She said during the election she wouldn't do it, but I've obviously been very persuasive in getting her to change the fiscal rules so we could get more investment. The very investment Mr Sawar talks about, which I think is really important, to invest in our infrastructure and in our housing stock in ensuring that this country's competitiveness is enhanced by that investment. So all of these things I welcome. But Mr Sawar is going to have to try to convey some of his enthusiasm to people other than me who are living in poverty who, and the families of children who are going to go into poverty because the two-child cap has not been lifted. And the... Uh, the Resolution Foundation estimate that by April of next year, April of next year, an additional 63,000 children will be affected.
by the failure to lift the, uh, the two-child cap. And there'll be individuals, uh, pensioners, who have lost their winter fuel payment who will not be greeting with enthusiasm the points that Mr Sawar is making. So I think what Mr Sawar has got to do is he's got to be He's got to recognise Briefly, that while there are Minister. welcome steps in the budget, there are issues that will prolong the agony of yeah. individuals in our society, yeah. and a Labour government should address that and right the wrongs that they're presiding over now. Yeah. Anna Sarwar. I've, I've always been clear that we can't fix every Tory mess in one budget, and of course we want to make further progress over the course of a Labour government. But let's come back to this Parliament. £1.5 billion of additional money this year £3.4 billion of additional money next year. That is more money for Scotland's NHS, schools and other vital public services. But more money is one thing. How the SNP government chooses to spend it is another. And the fact is that this is an incompetent SNP government that is bad with taxpayers' money. Yep. So more of the same won't cut it. With almost one in six Scots on an NHS waiting list, with Scotland's education system falling down the international league tables, with record levels of homelessness and 10,000 children living in temporary accommodation, we need a change of direction. Yeah. So will the First Minister finally end the blame game, end the SNP financial mismanagement, end SNP incompetence and waste, and ensure that Scots benefit from this transformative budget? First Minister. I'll, I'll go back and look at the parliamentary record of what I've said so far, but I don't think I've blamed anybody for anything today. Mr Sarwar has blamed the Tories quite fairly, actually. Yeah. I, well, I, I, actually, to correct the record, I did blame the Tories for 14 years of austerity, and that is correct. And I agree with Mr Sarwar on, on that particular point. But let's take a couple of the examples that Mr Sarwar talked about. On schools, when this government came to office, 63% of pupils in Scotland were educated in good or satisfactory school buildings. That figure now is over 90%. 90% because this government did the heavy lifting of investing in the school estate of Scotland. And then if we look at housing, yes, there is a housing challenge and there are far too many families living in temporary accommodation. But this government has presided over more affordable housing being built per head of population than any other part of the United Kingdom, and crucially, more than were built when the Labour Party was in government in Scotland before us. So we are, and, and actually, my, my dear friend Christine Graham uh, gives me some prompted comments from the side, which I shall pick up on. When we came into office, the Labour government was so incompetent, they couldn't even spend the money that was available to be spent on behalf of the people of Scotland. So what we will do, presiding officer, is we will continue what I have always done as a minister. We will deliver careful stewardship of the public finances to deliver for the people of Scotland. We will balance the books. We'll deliver value. That's what people get from a Swinney government. Question number three, Lorna Slater. Yesterday, the UK government presented a budget that they claim will put £1.5 billion back into the Scottish government's budget for this year. This money should ensure that some of the most damaging cuts announced by the Scottish government earlier this year should not now need to go ahead. Spending on the climate and nature emergencies is essential to ensure our planet has a livable future. Whilst the Scottish Greens were in government, climate and nature spending reached record levels. Will the First, government, will the First Minister commit to using this additional funding announced yesterday for this financial year to restore the funding cuts to the Nature Restoration Fund and active travel budgets? And does this mean that the Scottish Government no longer needs to use up all of the Scotland funding which was supposed to be invested in our green future? First Minister. I understand the importance that Lorna Slater and her colleagues attached to these areas of funding and it was a matter of deep regret to the Government that we had to uh, remove funding from those priorities to enable us to create a path to balance. One of the points I made in my earlier uh, comments was that the increase in funding for this financial year largely accords with our expectations in our internal planning. 
and is necessary to meet the costs of increased pay settlements and the effect of inflation that the Finance Secretary has previously explained to Parliament. So my expectation is not that we have any new capacity that uh, uh, opens up in this financial year. The resources that have been allocated so far, I expect, will be required to enable us to balance the budget during this year because of those uh, pay and inflationary costs that we are facing. That's very disappointing to hear about this year. I'll ask the First Minister about next year. One of our proudest moments for the Scottish Greens during our time in government was rolling out free school meals for all primary children at four and five, because we know it's a simple and effective way to address the impacts of child poverty and make sure every child has the best chance at school. We were on course to expand that to every child in primary school by the end of this session of Parliament until the Scottish Government put an indefinite delay on the rollout in this year's programme for government. Given the predicted £3.4 billion due to be added to next year's Scottish budget, will the First Minister reinstate the promise to deliver free school meals for the remaining pupils in primary six and seven by 2026, as endorsed by this Parliament a few weeks ago? First Minister. Presiding Officer, that's a, a, a proposal that, to which we will certainly give consideration in the budget process for the next financial year. And Lorna Slater puts to me a substantial proposition which can certainly be considered for the next financial year. Whether the resources are available to support it obviously is part of that whole budgeting process. But uh, I do give Lorna Slater the assurance that we will look at that question. Um, it was obviously, I recognise it was an issue that Parliament resolved upon, but obviously that has to have financial support within a budget. But I do give her the assurance uh, that that issue will be considered. And of course, the Finance Secretary is engaged in detailed discussions with all political parties in Parliament to secure the passage of the Government's budget for next year. And uh, we look forward to a discussion on that and other questions with Ms Slater and her colleagues and with other parties in Parliament. Question number four, Keith Brown. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has undertaken of the impact of the UK Government budget on Scotland. First Minister. So, sir, I called on the UK Government to prioritise increased investment in public services, infrastructure and tackling poverty. While the measures announced by the Chancellor yesterday are a step in the right direction, we still face significant cost pressures going forward. This is hardly surprising after 14 years of underinvestment by the previous United Kingdom Government. We are assessing what the UK budget means for Scotland's public finances and, in particular, whether the increased cost to the public sector of higher national insurance contributions of up to £500 million will be fully funded and when we might receive reimbursement. There is a danger that we won't have that certainty in time for the 25-26 Scottish budget process. It is clear that we will need to see continued investment over the coming years to provide the funding that our public services need. Mr. Brown. Can I thank the First Minister for the answer? And does he agree with me that the UK budget fails to deliver on the transformative change that people in Scotland were promised? And in fact, it continues the same broken austerity ideology of the Tories. Let's especially, hear Mr. Brown. Especially for those losing their winter fuel allowance and for those Let's suffering. Let's hear Mr. Brown. Especially for those losing their winter fuel payment and for those suffering under the hated two child cap. Yeah. In particular, does the First Minister agree that the UK Government's decision to increase national insurance contributions could have a severe financial impact on Scotland's public sector, potentially costing the Government, the NHS, schools, police and fire services hundreds of millions of pounds, and that the UK Government must at the very least fully mitigate any negative impact on the Scottish Government and public services in Scotland, and that any mitigation must be provided in addition to, and not as a substitute for, increases to Scotland's block grant? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, Mr Brown makes a uses a couple of examples which I think illustrate the remaining challenges, amongst many other remaining challenges that we face, of pensioners who have lost their winter fuel payment as a consequence of a decision by the United Kingdom Labour Government, and also the maintenance of the two-child cap, which is forcing um, more and more children and families into poverty as a consequence of its persistence. And it's beyond me why, when there is going to be a projected budget surplus in a three-year period, the two-child cap has not been lifted immediately by this government. We were told in the summer to be patient until the UK budget. Yeah. Well, we've been patient, yeah. and the Labour government has not delivered what people expected. Now, I recognise 
the need to increase taxation in this budget. I was arguing during the election campaign that that issue had to be confronted. I believe some of that increase could have come from the UK Government following the tax approach of the Scottish Government in asking those on higher incomes to pay more in taxation, which have, could have generated about £20 billion in increased revenue and could have avoided some of the punishing business taxes that have been applied particularly to the Scotch whisky industry and to First other Minister. sectors of the Scottish... I'm aware that in trying to uh, listen to your own response, there is a conversation carrying on across these benches, and I would ask members to stop. First Minister. Uh, officer, the, the point I was making is that there are tax choices to be made, and I'm, I'm, I'm one who's argued for taxes to increase. We've actually increased taxes, and there was a way the UK government could have done it by asking people in higher incomes to pay more in taxation. That would have generated about £20 billion worth in revenue and would have avoided some of the damaging tax increases, such as the one that is going to undermine the competitiveness of the Scotch whisky industry. Now, I understand why the Scotch whisky industry and why business is aggrieved at the Labour government, because they were promised economic stability, and they're not getting that from the Labour government. Yeah. Yeah. Brief supplementary, Michelle Thompson. The, the Office of Budget Responsibility have significantly downgraded their economic growth forecasts after the budget. The IFS has warned that the vast majority of the national insurance tax hike will hit working people through lower pay. Can I ask the First Minister as to his view as to the extent that the UK budget will usher in a new era of growth promised by the Secretary of State for Scotland? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I think some of the data that's been published is really very illustrative on the economic impact of the budget. Indeed, uh, the information from the Resolution Foundation uh, indicates that over the course of this Parliament, there is likely to be, about, uh, of the United Kingdom Parliament, about half a percent of increase in uh, average household incomes as a consequence of the measures that have been taken in the budget. Now, that will leave a lot of people feeling that their living standards have not increased in, in, in any meaningful fashion over the course of this parliamentary term. And that, of course, is, uh, uh, reinforces the point that uh, Michelle Thompson has made and is a point the Labour government will have to explain to the public. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what engagement the Scottish Government has had with Police Scotland officials who are responsible for investigating whether the actions of Professor El Jamil amounted to criminal conduct. First Minister. President Officer, the investigation of any crime is an independent matter for Police Scotland and the Scottish Government has no involvement in such matters. Scottish Government officials have met with Police Scotland in June this year to discuss the establishment of the public inquiry and other developing work and had some further engagement with Police Scotland in September. Liz Smith. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that response? Um, in his letter back to myself, to Willie Rennie and to Michael Marrow on the 17th of October, the Health Secretary quite rightly referred to the independent status of any Police Scotland investigation, and we respect that. However, we know that in November 2022, Police Scotland detectives appealed to the Scottish Government health officials for help, and that was four years after the first complaints were made to police. Officers made that plea for support to Craig White, a senior health director, who, as the Chamber knows, was later assigned to help set up the public inquiry into the El Jamel scandal. And Mr White replied to say to the Scottish Government that he would be happy to help investigating detectives. So as a matter of public interest, and based on what the First Minister has just said in his first response, can the First Minister tell me exactly on what basis that advice was being sought? Minister. I, I, I think I may have to have further exchanges with Liz Smith to understand exactly the point that she's wishing me to address. But what I would say to Liz Smith is that any approach from Police Scotland must properly independently conduct a police investigation, and Liz Smith accepts that point. Whatever information Police Scotland wished to obtain from the Scottish Government, I would expect. Scottish Government officials, Scottish Government ministers, to engage fully and substantively with Police Scotland on that question. And if there are any concerns about that, I will happily address them. But my expectation is that the Government would engage in uh, addressing any request for information or assistance from Police Scotland in supporting their independent investigation. Willie Rennie. 
The First Minister will understand the deep anxieties that are felt by the ex-patients of Professor El Jamil, especially as some of his constituents are in that uh, position. Um, there is deep anxiety from them about the circumstances of the police as asking for help from Craig White. Um, can the First Minister explore what possibly can be done to restore the confidence of those ex-patients in this process to make sure that they are seeing that this process is above board? First Minister. On, on that point, I, I, obviously Mr Rennie is familiar with the fact that I have constituents that are affected by this issue as well, and I engage with them in my constituency capacity. On the question of the engagement with Police Scotland, what I said to Liz Smith was uh, an attempt to be helpful in, in, in this respect, that I would expect the Government to provide Police Scotland with whatever information Police Scotland were looking for in relation to their inquiries. Now, if there are uh, deeper anxieties, I'm very happy to meet with Mr Rennie and Ms Smith and any other members who wish you know, my intervention on this question. I'm very happy to do so if there are any outstanding issues that arise from my answers today. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the reported rise in sex crimes. First Minister. Senator, so let me state strongly, as I've done previously, that violence against women is totally abhorrent. Whilst I want to see a reduction in sexual crimes, we all know that sexual crime is underreported. One of the multiple factors behind the rise includes a greater willingness of victims to come forward alongside increased support for survivors, including the use of pre-recorded evidence and a greater consistency in approach and use of specialist police officers. But it is the ending of such violence that should be our goal. Those who perpetuate sexual violence and abuse, the majority of whom are men, must be held to account, and it is only through fundamental societal change in the behaviours and attitudes of men that women can be protected. Pauline McNeill. Police Scotland received over 7,000 reports of sexual crimes between the start of April and the end of September this year, showing this upward trend. But that also included 20 per cent rise on reported rapes. So I do acknowledge what the First Minister said, and more people are reporting it, and that is progress. But this, of course, is indicative of the fact that male violence against women remains endemic, and the First Minister and myself agree on that. And there is no part of the world where women are safe from these types of crimes. I'm sure we agree on that too. But does the First Minister agree that if Scotland is to be a leading country in tackling this and how our criminal justice system treats victims of rape and sexual violence, when since the government voted to extend the limits for trials until the end of next year, and given one of the most distressing things for victims of sexual assault is the length of time that it takes to come to court, can the First Minister give Parliament a guarantee that the Government will not seek any further extensions on the court time limits, as it did yesterday, to give victims some comfort that delays will continue to reduce inner courts? First Minister. The, the, there is um, the overwhelming majority of what Paul McNeill says, if not all of it, I, I agree with. And I would say I would commend Police Scotland for the work that they've done in, in, in actually in, in perhaps driving some of this reporting through the very successful That Guy campaign, which I think is acknowledged across the parliamentary chamber as one of our most effective uh, means of communication. I think the, 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 the government is still dealing with the implications of the COVID pandemic on the criminal justice system, and we have sought approvals from parliament for um, further extensions. Um, we will not seek any further extensions to those arrangements. Uh, so I give Polly McNeill that assurance today. Uh, and obviously there are other steps that we can take. Indeed, yesterday, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Court of Appeal um, uh, determined on the Lord Advocate's reference in relation to issues on corroboration, which obviously has an effect on some of these questions in relation to prosecution as well. Pam Gossel. Thank you, presiding officer. Figures released early this week have shown that 1,400 rape allegations have been made in Scotland between April and September of this year, representing an increase of around 20 per cent from the same period last year. While it is encouraging that more survivors are coming forward and reporting this abuse, more needs to be done. Last year, I worked with a rape survivor, Ellie Wilson, to urge 
the Scottish Government to introduce guidance on how higher education institutions should handle cases of sexual misconduct. Therefore, I ask the First Minister what progress has his Government made to ensure that such guidance is issued? First Minister. I, I'll, I'll need to uh, give Pam Gosal a letter with the definitive answer to that question. But uh, during my time as Education Secretary, for example, I took forward um, work uh, along with uh, ministerial colleagues um, on the uh, MLA test, which was in relation to the uh, terrible circumstances of Emily, uh, Emily Drew, who was the, uh, the victim of um, uh, sexual violence. And um, that was rolled out within the higher education sector. And obviously, I'll look with care at the point that Pam Gosso makes. But there are a range of interventions we have to take to ensure that individuals are able to come forward. But there's also steps we have to take to change the culture amongst men and their attitude towards sexual violence. And that has to change to improve the lives of women in our society. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As convener of the Criminal Justice Committee, I've heard much testimony from survivors of sexual violence and what they perceive to be a barrier to their cases getting to court. Can the First Minister outline whether yesterday's decisions of the Appeal Court on corroboration will improve access to justice for victims of sexual crimes? First Minister. Uh, President, so the, the Lord Advocate's view of yesterday's decision is that it has the potential to transform the way all offences are prosecuted, and in particular sexual offences, and that will contribute to the development, and I quote, of a progressive and humane justice system. So I, I welcome any decision that will do that, and I'm sure everyone in the Chamber will do so as well. Um, as Audrey Nicholl will recall, I served on the Criminal Justice Committee uh, under her convenership uh, last year, and I heard much of the testimony to which uh, Audrey Nicholl refers. It is powerful testimony, and the Government is taking forward the contents of the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill, uh, which uh, commits to having a trauma-informed justice system that puts victims and witnesses at its heart. And um, we want to make sure that anyone who's been a victim of a sexual crime to have confidence in our justice system. Can we move to general and constituency supplementaries? I call Christine Graham. Oh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister will be aware that without any notice to the Scottish Government, NHS Lothian has withdrawn its 200,000 or thereabouts share of funding for Veterans First Point service, leaving the Scottish Government alone to fund this. With Glencore's barracks in my constituency, I am aware how specialised and vital this service is for veterans, providing mental and emotional support, both through professional interventions and also with the help of peers. Does the First Minister agree with me that this is a very wrong decision by NHS Lothian, and particularly cruel and thoughtless as we approach Remembrance Day? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, I, I understand there is engagement going on with um, NHS Lothian about that very question. These services are vital. It's important that the, uh, our veterans community are well supported at all times, but particularly in relation to the uh, period around Remembrance Day. And I know that the Health Secretary and also the Minister for Veterans, Graham Day, uh, will take a close interest in the issues that my colleague have ra has raised today. Jimmy Halker Johnston. Last week, the Health Secretary and Deputy First Minister met with those campaigning to keep Moss Park Care Home in Fort William open. However, since that meeting, there has been no announcement so far of any progress, and social workers have begun contacting residents and their families, telling them their loved ones are to be moved. I am sure the First Minister appreciate, appreciates the fear and frustration that is causing those residents and their families, and that they deserve answers on what efforts are being made to keep them in the place many now call home. So can the First Minister advise me and those protesting outside Highland Council today at the closure what role the Scottish Government has played in efforts to keep Moss Park open and what support it has offered Highland Council and NHS Highland to make that happen? First Minister. I, I, I understand the significance of the point that Mr Halker Johnson raises with me and obviously I'm particularly concerned about this issue because the situation on delayed discharges in Highland is particularly acute and the closure the, pres the proposed closure that Mr Halker Johnson raises will only exacerbate that situation, so it is moving in the wrong direction. The Government has engaged substantively, obviously, the Health Secretary and the Deputy First Minister in her uh, local representative capacity have, uh, have been engaged in these discussions, but all possible options have been explored by the Government. And I understand this issue is, as Mr Halker Johnson puts to me, being considered by 
Highland Council today and the Government stands ready to be uh, willing and engaged to try to find a solution because the, uh, the impact of the proposed closure is moving in entirely the opposite direction to the one I want to see things moving. Mr Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Loganair Chief Executive said at the weekend that the flight from Stornoway to Inverness is difficult to sustain. This flight is a lifeline service for those needing to access healthcare services not available locally. We have already seen patients no longer accepting treatment due to the downgrading of the US flights, and this would also happen if the Stornoway and Inverness flight were to stop or indeed become less accessible. I appealed to Scottish ministers to find a solution to the US flight, but nothing has changed. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister to intervene personally to ensure the US flights are fit for purpose and to protect all those flights with a PSO? If, if he does not, lives will be lost. Yeah. First Minister. Brazil, so some weeks ago, I had a discussion in Stornoway with um, uh, an organisation, and the name is just not at the front of my mind, who, who provide support and care to um, those who are patients who require to access cancer treatment, and we discussed the substantive challenges that uh, Rhoda Grant raises with me about the practicalities of accessing hospital treatment from the islands when a sustained uh, period of care is required. I give uh, Rhoda Grant the assurance that the Health Secretary and the Transport Ministers are looking very closely at this situation to ensure that uh, we are providing all the support we can to make sure that individuals who require to access health care needs are able to do so, regardless of their location. Order MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A number of third sector organisations across Edinburgh Pentlands, including the Dove Centre, Wester Hills Health Agency and the Broomhouse Community One Stop Shop, have been notified by the Edinburgh Integrated Joint Board that funding will soon be cut by over £800,000 and across Edinburgh by £4.5 million. If these cuts go ahead, how will the Scottish Government ensure that some of the most vulnerable people in my constituency are supported to lead healthier and more stable lives? Minister. Mr. Sir, I, I understand the significance of the issue that Mr Macdonald raises with me, and I am uh, very familiar with um, the Broomhouse area of the city. I grew up very close to Broomhouse, so I know its challenges and its circumstances. Uh, obviously, the Government uh, attaches a great importance to supporting the third sector in the delivery of services and the impact that they can make. I understand on this particular issue that decisions have not been made yet by the Edinburgh Integrated Joint Board. Uh, these uh, proposals will be discussed uh, tomorrow, um, but I stress to Mr Macdonald the importance the Government attaches to ensuring that we have in place the uh, proper services that will meet the needs of individuals and communities. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware that Stephen Flynn lobbied for an offshore wind project which the Scottish Government approved, and one month later he received a donation from one of the beneficiaries of that project of £30,000. A Scottish Government official on behalf of Gillian Martin appeared to fast-track a ministerial reply in response to Flynn's request, and a few months later the project was approved. If the First Minister has nothing to hide, he has nothing to fear, so will he order an investigation into the handling of this consent process by the Scottish Government? Yeah. First Minister. Uh, I have no intention of doing that because the, process, because the process has been properly conducted and information. And, Let's hear and, the First Minister. And I really don't think it should be a surprise that a government that, in its policy position, is supportive of renewable energy developments has taken a decision to authorise a renewable policy, a renewable energy project. It is Mr. Just Lumsden, Mr. Lumsden, you have put your question. I would like to hear the response, First Minister. Um, Presiding officer, there um, was um, information uh, released under uh, freedom of information requests on um, uh, earlier this year which show no breaches of protocol, and I really don't think it's a big surprise that a government that has had a consistent policy position for 17 years in favour of renewable energy development should take a decision to consent a renewable energy development. What this represents 
is the grubbing at the bottom yeah. of a barrel yeah. by Douglas Lumsden and the Conservatives. Yeah. It debases this parliament, it debases the Conservative Party, and it shows they have got nothing constructive to see yeah. in Scottish politics. Michael Mara. Th thank you, President Officer. Can I draw the Chamber's attention to my register of interest as a member of the GMB Trade Union? In 2019, a job evaluation process for district nurses working for NHS Tayside resulted in their jobs being upgraded. NHS Tayside have thus far refused to honour that pay rise and pay the women what they are due. Uh, GMB Scotland have appealed to the Cabinet Secretary for Health to intervene, and he has refused, citing the fact that the job evaluation process is an independent process. But, First Minister, he is right, of course, but that process is long since complete. The question now is whether the Health Board pay the workers the money they are due. But can I ask the First Minister to take a personal interest to ensure that these workers in NHS Tayside, which does serve as constituents, get the money that they deserve? First Minister. Uh, I, I think the, 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 I understand all of the issues that Ms Amara puts to me. Uh, the, the, the complication here is that there is a, a due process to be gone through which involves a uh, the possibility of tribunal. And I understand this issue is going to tribunal, which is a material part of the process of determining these issues. Now, I know that's cold comfort to anybody who's affected by this, but it is the process that we have to go through to determine on these issues. But if there is anything um, further that can be added to that, I will consider whether there is a case for that. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will now be point of order to Glyss Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. On a point of order, um, at decision time last night, Parliament was tied 62 to 62 on my colleague Alexander Burnett's motion to annul the Local Services Franchises Regulations. With Deputy Presiding Officer Liam McArthur in the chair and the other Deputy Presiding Officer voting along her party's whip, the SNP were already granted an artificial boost to their voting numbers compared to if you had been in the chair, Presiding Officer. And I did raise an eyebrow at the exact number of SNP MSPs voting. It was one more than I thought when we consider the pairing arrangements. That aside, the Deputy Presiding Officer cast their deciding vote against the motion to annul and stated that the reason was protecting the status quo. And as Alec Cole Hamilton pointed out in his point of order, preserving the status quo would actually have been achieved by voting in favour of the motion. This is because a negative instrument, which is still a new law, is subject to less democratic scrutiny and can only be stopped by a motion to annul it. Now, if the vote had been on an affirmative SSI, an LCM, an amendment at stage three of a bill, or even the final vote of the bill itself, the Deputy Presiding Officer would have cast a vote against creating the new law. On this occasion, the Deputy Presiding Officer cast their vote to pass a new law, and in doing so, created a majority in Parliament where one did not exist. I seek your guidance as to whether Chamber protocol was followed correctly last night because from where I'm standing, it seems as if the SNP have passed new regulations against the clear will of both committee and parliament with the backing of the casting vote from the chair. Thank you, President. Officer. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. The parliament was asked whether the instrument should be annulled and it was unable to decide that matter. Therefore, the presiding officer in the chair cast a vote against that change. Last night's vote means that the motion to annul fell and means that the negative SSI stays in place. We will now suspend business for a break to enable the Chamber and the Gallery to clear before we move on to members' business.